Hey, this is May's Daughter of Darkness, Book 2, Chapter 6, Part 2. Sitting down with our backs against a friendly wall to rest and our knees up, and not doing anything but breathing side by side, ace to an ace, and the very ace I loved. Together we would just fucking breathe with our backs to the wall. Breathe, then wait and watch. Wait for the world to recover some dignity. Watch the assortment of characters pass by. In a city, no one bothers you with your back against brick wall. I swear they would walk by without even looking, because to look at someone sitting down with someone else, backs against the wall, was to presume they were beggars asking for change. Anyone sitting down with surround sound of shoes and boots scuffing the pavement and wheels, skateboards, bikes, and wheelchairs had to be defeated, they presumed on some level and therefore in need and ready at any moment to lash out at you with a request, a demand for help. And everyone knew that a request for help was to be denied at any cost of the one asking. Everyone knew that those who ask for help are not truly in need because those who are truly in need do not ask for help. The American ways are peculiar. All I was saying was blessing me and anyone really could sit down just about anywhere on the ground with any wall to our backs and our backs to the wall and feel supported. I mean, not to be bothered by most of the world. And neither were we in need. And neither were we asking for help. The two of us, sitting there, aces, and watching the world go by. About Freddy. Once I was chewing bubblegum, and became absent-minded and took the gum out of my mouth because my jaw got tired. Then I put it back in and chewed some more. I can be very conservative like that. I might use a tea bag two or three times to brew tea. I roll up the toothpaste tube until it strikes the end and push and push every last bit of paste out. I'll use a bar of soap until it's thin as a reed. You could use it for a saxophone. I'll chew all the flavor out of the gum and did then plucked it out again on the tip of my forefinger. I was talking or listening to Freddy and somehow the gum got in my hair and wouldn't let go. I was so upset because I thought I'd have to cut off a swab of my hair. It had happened before and the scissors, oh no, the scissors. Freddy saw I was upset and sat me in a chair and sat down next to me and got some WD-40 or something and began to work the gum out of my hair real slow and methodical like a pro. And it took hours, I mean, I must have been crying by the end to see a man care that much about me he would actually de-gum my hair. Then afterwards, because he could not save it all, he demanded to take me to a stylist of my choice and dead. Then he waited for me with all these high-class women getting their ombres faded and bangs sharpened in the forefront of a high-end salon halfway into Berkeley on College Avenue. He was the only man in the place on a weekday morning, the glass storefront so clear we almost crashed into it, were it not for the Helvetica script spelling out the store hours. And though he looked and felt horribly out of place, he didn't care. He was there for me. I was lying back in the barber's chair with half my head dipped in a basin and shut my eyes as the stylist massaged the shampoo and conditioner into a rinse. The back of my neck felt so good and warm.